I will admit that I do use Amazon still because it is so ubiquitous because I used to shop at Whole Foods and then they purchased Whole Foods and it's just kind of this habit, but I'm trying to do it less. Uh, Prime Day, June 22nd. <laughs> Explain to the audience what this thing is that Amazon has created. So Prime Day was founded in 2015, founded. Prime Day was invented in 2015 uh, in honor of Amazon's 20th anniversary. And it's a sales holiday, which, you know, it's in some senses, it's not it's not all that different from like free Slurpee Day. Um, but it was invented for Prime members to get really big discounts. They wanted to rival Black Friday. They explicitly wanted to rival Black Friday with all the deals that you could possibly get on, on all of the things that Amazon sells, which is everything. And so, you know, you can get like a TV for 50% off or whatever, and it has grown. Originally it was a small number of deals on a single day. Now it's a two day extravaganza and there's an entire ecosystem devoted to sussing out what the best deals are and where you can find the, the TV for 50% off. Um, and it is a legitimate holiday. It is uh, it, like hundreds of millions of people take part in it. I, I believe um, based on some numbers that I crunched that more Americans buy things on Amazon Prime Day than buy turkeys on Thanksgiving. It's a, it's a huge thing. Um, <laughs> and it is all intended to sort of feed this beast that is Amazon Prime, which is a huge, huge, huge force in our economy, in the way people shop. It has 200 million members worldwide, um, 150-ish in the US, which is more than there are households in the US. And Prime Day is intended to reward Prime members and keep them loyal, but also to draw in new people because if you're getting an electronic for $200 off and the Prime membership is only $120, there you go. It's worth it on the spot. Right. So, I mean, I wanted to back up a little bit. Thank you for that, that expansive explanation um, about why this day was created and when it was created, right? So uh, it was in, Prime in and of itself was introduced in 2005 as a fairly narrow service. Um, how did it become what it is today? And how did Prime Day, which I think was created 10 years after the mm -hmm. service of Prime was created, how did it become into this all-encompassing thing where, I mean, you write, uh, it's the second biggest subscription service in the world after Netflix. And, you know, uh, that's incredibly successful, especially because Netflix is like a, a passive consumption vehicle, right? You can just turn it on your smart TV and you can listen as opposed to Amazon, which has its hands in groceries or TVs or books or whatever. I mean, it's, it's, it's completely, uh, ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Prime Day was originally, um, was originally founded at a time when founded Prime Day came into existence at a moment when Amazon was a much smaller company. It's kind of hard to believe it now, but Amazon was probably still, you know, at the time that, that Prime Day was invented, or sorry, at the time that Prime was invented, Amazon was a very big retailer, but everyone's good money in Silicon Valley was on eBay. It was sort of struggling to fight against eBay, which everyone thought eBay was valued like probably twice as much as Amazon at the time. And everyone thought that eBay was going to win out and Amazon was scrappy and their whole thing was um, always innovating on behalf of the customer. And so if you think about it that way, Prime makes a lot of sense. You know, it it eliminates on Amazon's side the calculate like having to calculate shipping costs for people. It encourages people to buy more things because you're kind of trying to make back the money that you spent on the membership. So you know, when Amazon first introduced Prime, it was I think 79 bucks for a year. They've slowly added to that price, but they've also added things to the bundle. So. They started uh, Prime Video, their streaming service. They then bought Whole Foods. And when they bought Whole Foods, that unlocked all of these discounts for Prime users. And, you know, it is 
like Prime really fuels the Amazon growth machine. Um, the, the fees from Prime, which are, you know, if you do the math on 150 in the US, 200 worldwide, Prime users paying at least 120 bucks a year, that's billions of dollars. Um, that fuels Amazon's bottom line, but it also fuels the sort of consumption pattern that we have all gotten into. Um, internally at Amazon, they call it a flywheel. So basically the idea is that um, low prices draw people in, the more people you have um, using your service, the more you can build out fulfillment centers, the more you can um, buy other companies that make the product more appealing to people, the more people you hire, the more delivery drivers you hire, the more warehouse employees you hire, the more data you collect, and it just keeps kind of growing and growing and growing. And like Prime is the engine of all of that. Prime is what makes it all make sense because you don't need all of these huge fulfillment centers all over the United States if, if uh, consumers don't expect a package in one day. Um, you need like, it, it sort of like, Prime is both the financial engine for all of the stuff that is Amazon, but it's also the, the reason for its existence. Yeah, and, and, and um, I mean, y y some of the shocking statistics that you write in your piece is that uh, Amazon's value multiple multiplied around 97 times since uh, the introduction of Prime and um, that flywheel example, it's just about really how the gravitational pull of these, of these, this service brings more people in, as you say. And I, I find it funny that you wrote about how Jeff Bezos came up with this concept and wrote it on a napkin, which is a bit of the, the capitalist kind of uh, consumerist, greedy version of how J.K. Rowling came up with the Harry Potter series. I mean, that's really, I'm a dork. That's the first thing I thought of. But I mean, how much is Bezos involved in this in, in terms of just the, the being the brains behind this kind of consumerist uh, invention that's, that's so, um, so addicting and so profitable just at a, at, has a, a very high floor uh, in terms of making Amazon a ton of money. Yeah, I mean, Bezos's fingerprints are all over Amazon. He has these principles. Um, I forget how many of them, but um, there are these sort of like biz school kind of principles that everyone in Amazon has totally internalized and kind of like repeat to each other all the time. The flywheel is one of these things that it is just kind of company lore. Like the, every, if you work at Amazon uh, corporate in Seattle, you like, this is what you sort of have internalized about what your job is. And his thing, Bezos' thing, and a lot of the top leadership at Amazon's thing is always about the customer. It's like relentless pursuit of quality for the customer. They would never describe it the way I'm describing it, the way you're describing it, which is that it is also about turning these obscene profits. But the way they think about it is that everything they do is for the customer. And that is a, that is a Bezos thing. Um, the thing that is so interesting about the way he thinks about this is that he connected things being good for the customer with things being good for the bottom line. He found ways to make what customers want align perfectly with what Amazon wants. And a lot of times in business, there's this idea that if something's good for the customer, it's bad for the company's bottom line. But when you're working at the scale Amazon is working, those two things can be in alignment, which is sort of scary because it means that the company can just sort of grow and grow and grow forever. Well, but, and it also know. means it also means that the workers are not aligned with this, you know, in terms of what there's a third there's a third party involved here. There's the corporation. There are the customers, this massive customer base, both the corporation and the customer base have a lot of power. The third party is the worker workforce, uh, which it's been well documented how poorly Amazon workers are treated. Yeah, it's uh, the warehouse workers have a really hard job. It is very physically intense. You know, people, there have been reports of workers walking 20 miles a day through these giant million square foot warehouses. 
Um, there are injuries. It, there's constant surveillance. You know, it is a job where you have to scan a new item every 11, every 11 seconds. And if you don't scan the items fast enough, you'll get dinged. Um, and Amazon's starting wage uh, for these jobs is about 15 bucks an hour, which many people argue is probably, you know, is better than many other jobs, but it's not a, it's not a pathway to the middle class. Like these jobs are jobs that are really, really, in some cases, literally backbreaking and they're tough jobs. And the consumer never sees that. The consumer never sees all of the, the labor, the, the like miracle of precision logistics that goes into that goes into getting these things to your front door. You know, like if I could right now go on amazon.com and order, you know, a koosh ball or some obscure book from another country or, you know, like 2000 thumbtacks or whatever it is I want. And it could get to my house in 24 hours. Thinking about how that works, thinking about like transportation and labor and, all of the logistics, all of the kind of like organization that needs to go into that is sort of mind boggling, but consumers don't think about it because Amazon has made all of those mechanisms invisible. Hi, I'm Sam Cedar. You can watch the rest of this interview and more on our Peacock show, which streams at 5 p.m. weekdays on The Choice from Peacock TV.